uh, this organization called VOC that has been trying to, uh, to fight against repressive measures in Holland since about five years. But I thought this was a fitting picture to start with. It's from a, it's from a book, uh, 1859, and it would, it's called uh, The Flora of the Netherlands. So even back then, this was considered and, and was in the books as just an uh, indigenous plant in the Netherlands. So this is not something that started in the 60s in, uh, in Holland. It, it actually goes way back. Okay, so the story about uh, the, the, the new VOC, as I could, as I could uh, explain, for, for Dutch cannabis activism, uh, really starts in a place in Amsterdam called the Cannabis College. If you ever get to Amsterdam, it's uh, surely worth a visit to go there. It's a free information center, a real nice place with the uh, knowledgeable people working there. In 2008, this, uh, this cannabis college had their 10-year anniversary. So they did a, like a film festival on uh, war on drugs as a subject for a film festival, but also a thing they called uh, the Cannabis Tribunal which was very nice in a, in a nice uh, location in The Hague in the center of power where we put forward the, uh, the notion that cannabis prohibition has, has a lot more uh, bad, bad, more bad effects than good effects, that was basically what we were saying. We had to the left here Ben Dronkers from Sensi Seeds he, uh, he volunteered to put 200,000 euros in the pot for any politician or anybody who could prove us wrong with what we were saying, that really cannabis prohibition, a lot more worse side effects than, than good effects on society. So this was a very interesting, uh, an interesting event where we could see this, for, for myself personally, was really one of the highlights of, the, of this first cannabis tribunal, the, the guy you see talking here. He's, you could really call him the intellectual father of our famous Dutch condoning coffee shop cannabis policy. He, he was from, from early in the 60s on and in the 70s, he was really the pivotal force who thought this all up, the whole concept of, of decriminalizing. So we were lucky to have him and we, he wasn't on the program in any way, but somebody recognized him and, and invited him to, uh, to speak and he gave what turned out to be really his last uh, public speech ever because he died only a few months after this. So one of the aspects of this event, the Cannabis, cannabis Tribunal, is that it brought to, uh, together a lot of people involved in cannabis in Holland who'd only know each other by name. But here at the Cannabis Tribunal for the first time, then they got to know each other. So a lot, some of these people had the notion that it, instead of just having this one event meeting each other and saying bye-bye again and not uh, cooperating, it would be good to have an organization as sort of a platform for all the people involved in cannabis, whether it be from the industry or activists or scientists or, co or consumers or producers, just literally uh, create a space that people could be sitting around one table. And of course the, the Cannabis College itself was a, and still is a great place for us to do our monthly meetings because right after the Cannabis Tribunal, so we founded this organization, VOC, and we had a monthly meeting ever since, never missed out once, which is I think very important if you want to keep ap activism alive, you should not uh, slack on it. You should not say, well, there are only a few people, so let's not do the, uh, the monthly meeting. Uh, so, yeah, then we tried to, uh, to get out this message, the, the, the slogan here that we printed on a large smoking paper read, uh, reads, uh, Cannabis, don't criminalize it, but regulate it, which is basically still our, our main uh, objective, of course, for VOC. We also made a, a professional DVD documentary on the Cannabis Tribunal, where we had all the politicians nicely edited and really put the thing forward, so to use on the internet, but also give out to politicians. We gave every single member of parliament one of these copies of the, of the DVD. Then another thing we did uh, pretty much in the first few months, to our own disgrace, with the Million Marijuana March, there was not a single event in Holland back in 2009. So to, uh, to at least join in with, with the global uh, actions and campaigns for legalizing, we, we made up this event called Cannabis Liberation Day that we first uh, held in 2009 and we, we, made the, we, we borrowed the name of the Liberation Day of course from the official 
uh, days that we celebrate our, our liberation in the Second World War. This is the original, the, the official logo for the official liberation day. So we just slightly changed it so that instead of just this, uh, this torch we have here, it's something a bit more smokable. <laughs> These are some pictures from the first event. It was great at the Amsterdam Museum Square. A few hundred people turned up. Of course, Avert was there with his vaporizers. He's also he's here in the tent, just a few meters down. If you get a chance, go visit his stand because he makes brilliant uh, Dutch vaporizers. Uh, soon after we had uh, our first election campaign, we kept on doing this. Whenever there's an election, we use the coffee shops. There are still about, now about 620 coffee shops left for the whole country and uh, about a million people, Dutch people, come there easily. So this is an interesting way to get these people to actually vote and explain to them what party is cannabis friendly and what, can, what party is not cannabis friendly. So we posted this uh, also on, on the public, the, the official uh, election boards as well and let people go to this, uh, to this website where they can find out what their party uh, says about cannabis policy. This is uh, one, of, uh, one of actions we did. Uh, you probably have heard of the, the backdoor problem, what we call the backdoor problem of the coffee shop. It's one of, of, of a lot of paradoxes within the policy uh, in Holland. So yeah, a coffee shop, they are allowed to sell you weed as a consumer, but the coffee shop itself cannot produce the weed or, or buy it wholesale. The, the government thinks that all the cannabis every day comes falling out of the sky into the coffee shop, like this. So we try to address this problem by going to Parliament and actually finding the back door of Parliament and symbolically hammering uh, this appeal that we had to finally try and solve this paradox and make some sort of regulation for, uh, for, to solve the back door problem. So this, we, we started getting some publicity with this kind of actions. Here's uh, Mr. Frederick uh, Polak, one of our co-founders at the, the Second Cannabis Tribunal, sitting in the audience. <laughs> what was very nice is this guy on the left, he's our former Prime Minister of the Netherlands and he's the guy who was in power and really was responsible for implementing the coffee shop policy in the 70s, a Christian politician. So we got him to, to speak the, the final word at the Cannabis Tribunal. And he made it very clear that he's sorry now that back then in the 70s he only went as far to regulate the sale with the coffee shop but never got round to any regulation of the production. So he, he effectively said sorry and made an appeal at the politicians who were there on the spot at this event to finally after over 35 years address this, this whole issue, the backdoor problem. And one of the politicians that was in the audience, he's now the Under Minister of Justice. But I don't know, I think his, uh, his head is pretty thick because the message didn't really come across even though it was given by our former Prime Minister. <laughs> and then when uh, Mark Emery was uh, being threatened to be uh, extradited from, from uh, Canada to the, US, to the US, we also made a small uh, campaign at the Canadian, uh, Canadian Embassy in The Hague to uh, to uh, yeah to protest against this and we we took the balloons with the little bags of hemp seeds there and uh, let them go up in the air and also planted quite some seeds in the garden right there of the of the Canadian embassy so uh, the, this event cannabis liberation day has been growing uh, like steadily every year it's it, we keep it free and we keep it alcohol free as well and we try to really focus on, uh, like we see here, really all aspects of the hemp plant. So the a main part of the uh, event is to have a real good hemp market and show all the other sides there are to cannabis instead of just smoking. So here's Soma who, did, who gave a brilliant speech, I must say, at this year, at that year's edition that he was there. And uh, it's, it's interesting to get like well-known, try to get well-known uh, pop musicians to actually come out and, and, and play at Cannabis Liberation Day in front of this weed banner because that's what we really need. The, the stigma has been growing steadily over the last 10 years in Holland, whereas people now are really, really scared to talk openly about their use of cannabis. 
which is crazy for a country like Holland. This never used to be, or at least it wasn't like this from, say, the 70s well into the 90s. Uh, one other thing we did, because the regulation of the production it would really be the big issue, that all the troubles that we have now surrounding coffee shops and, and criminality really, oil, all, it all boils down to uh, no regulation for the production. So then we organized a series of debates around Holland in different uh, coffee shops in different provinces and tried to uh, come up with a real model that would be good also for consumers to have all the, the parties interested and really do the, the work of the politicians by giving them a model that they could use if they want to. And at the Amsterdam debate we had uh, even Ed Rosenthal coming in and uh, giving his feedback on how to regulate and what, what, what kind of things that you, that you encounter if you start legalizing. So this was quite interesting. Uh, also, uh, you can say like in, in any form of activism that the distribution of information is really one of the essential things that you're doing and, and cannabis activism is certainly no exception. So when this uh, documentary came out on DVD, uh, uh, the Len Richmond film, we, uh, we got into contact with, with Len Richmond himself and explained that what we are doing and what we would like to do is have all these copies of the movie and distribute them to all members of parliament in, uh, in The Hague. So this we did and also a few uh, cabinet ministers, uh, ministers came by because we did the, the campaign on a Friday when they have their weekly meeting, so that was good. They, they couldn't escape us. They would all get one of these uh, cannabis DVDs with a good letter accompanying it. Um, after a few years you started, you, you see that if you're consistent in quality and in, in, in doing events and having a good website and never make any mistakes, be real factual, then eventually media will uh, invite you so you can at least have some uh, arguments against all the, the, the political propaganda and all the misconceptions that there are around cannabis. So here is Joop uh, Omer, he's also one of our co-founders, uh, explaining on TV about the weed pass. Uh, a, a quick introduction, the idea was uh, we don't want foreign tourists in our coffee shops anymore which is of course, it's a, it's a crazy idea. It, it, it boils down almost to a kind of apartheid where you say, this is only for our countrymen. So of course, this has been a big rallying point for, uh, for the VOC organization uh, over the last years really, to, to demonstrate and to, to show these people all that you're doing is helping the black market again. We got it sort of, we got it organized so that the black market is, was always really small because we had the coffee shops in Holland. And now by introducing this, this tourist ban with the wheat pass, of course, you're only helping those guys who sell out on the street. Unfortunately, like this, uh, this newspaper uh, sort of sums up, this is our minister of justice and this is how he, he treats advice and criticism. He doesn't, he simply doesn't listen to it. So we're still stuck with this guy. Here's some more uh, Cannabis Liberation Day picks. Here's a, a little pun we did on the name of our Minister of Justice, whose, nam, whose name you would translate as being on stilts. That, that's his literal name. So we had this fake uh, Minister of Justice trying to check everybody's weed pass that attended uh, Cannabis Liberation Day. So this was fun, the, the media liked it, you know, that kind of thing. What I'm trying to, to sort of show to you that activism goes all ways and should go all ways. You want to be at, in, in the parliament, you want to write them real good emails timed well, but you also want to have public events and you want to constantly try and um, get the media to have some sort of positive message or at least ask some questions around this cannabis policy that you... Uh, yeah, the, the, the questions that nobody really asks in the, in the media anyway. Here's the third, we, we did a total of, of three cannabis uh, tribunals and this one was meant to establish like what, what would be the ideal model for regulation uh, in Holland. He was one of the, the people that spoke, we, we call him in, in Holland the pot father. He's the guy who opened the first ever coffee shop in Amsterdam Mellow Yellow and also opened the first ever grow shop in Europe. So this is really... Uh, it was quite an honor to have a pioneer like this also joining the discussion in what, what could be the, uh, the ideal regulation model now. Wernacht, Wernacht Bruining, yeah. Let me call his name. 
This was when the, the debates was really uh, starting to heat up about the wheat pass. Is this wheat pass coming or not? So we staged a small, a small theatrical demonstration almost right in front of Parliament in The Hague where we had a few uh, like international drug barons and criminals actually thanking our government and thanking our Minister of Justice for really boosting their sales. It was quite a lot of fun. And also we, we, uh, we influenced the youth vote, yeah, as you can see in this picture. <laughs> then when, it, uh, it, the, the, when the coffee shop policy existed 35 years, we uh, thought this would be really a, a, a reason to, to stage some sort of uh, action in the Netherlands. And we actually have a, one monument in the country, it's the monument for tolerance. So we thought this would be really the, the ideal spot to go to. It's in, in Hilversum, a small town in the center where all the media are. So we made uh, this wreath, you can see at the bottom, made, made out of cannabis plants. And uh, we put it there and uh, just always trying to keep, keep this issue on the agenda. The final debate for the wheat pass, of course, we were, our proposition was all the time, the first article of the Dutch constitution actually forbids any form of discrimination on whatever grounds. So this includes the, where you live. So if you put this wheat pass tourist ban policy into effect, you're effectively burying the first article of our constitution. So this is what we did on that day of the final debate, is hand out it is sort of like a death certificate for, uh, for the first article of our constitution to let them think. If you do want to do this, you're, you're actually ruining our constitution right there. Just a few months later, to give you some sort of impression, it's, for me as a Dutch uh, person, it's so strange to, to go to these fairs also in Spain and in all these countries you see total uh, blossoming of an industry and of activism as well. You get new magazines, more magazines, they're thicker. This is actually, the, the, that's why they made the cover like this. They, uh, it's Essenzi, it was one of the two main uh, cannabis magazines in Holland. It was there for 14 years and they uh, stopped last year because in the political climate we have in Holland it's really not possible anymore. Uh, the, the, the businesses, they don't dare to advertise in, in Dutch magazines, it's really, uh, it's quite awful. Here's another one of the, the, the voting campaigns, because that was the good news. Right in the middle of this oldest weed pass controversy, the government resigned early. So then we had another chance to vote in some parties that were at least a bit more okay than the other ones. So here's the, the, the button campaign where people could state, I vote cannabis friendly. And below it, it reads, don't let your vote go up in smoke. This is a, one example of what we do with the direct lobbying to the politicians. Uh, apart from the weed pass measure, there's this other quite threatening measure they want to implement. And that is to have any uh, cannabis product that has more than 15% THC uh, in it they will declare it a hard drug and put it on list one of our schedule of uh, illegal drugs. Which is, of course, anybody who knows anything about weed and the, the, the different, uh, the different uh, things that are in there knows that this is complete bullshit. Even to put it at 15%, why not put it at 14 or 19%? Nobody knows. So we, what we do is make these kinds of brochures that we uh, get to the politicians, also the local politicians, just to give them some real background information with the nice, all the references there. We're, we're not making this up. You can go to the internet, it's all there. And try to get, really, get some sense into them so that they understand this will be even a bigger failure than the wheat pass if you go ahead with this plan of the maximum 15% uh, THC. Some final uh, photos for this year's uh, edition of uh, Cannabis Liberation Day. It's really we don't have a fair like uh, Cannafest or Spanabis anymore in Holland. It's, it's crazy. I think the last one was about five or six years ago. This has been effectively banned to just have an event like we are celebrating here. So this means that uh, the Cannabis Liberation Day th that we organize is really the only uh, public cannabis event that people can go to also for free. 
and it's a lot of fun every year. If you uh, want to make it, it uh, next year it'll be on the 15th of June. So the, right in the middle of June on the weekend in Amsterdam. It's also from last year. The guy here to the right, he is the, the, the chairman of VOC and also the founder of uh, Cannabis College, uh, Henk Ponsen. I put this photo in because I, I was really happy to take it. What you see here is really three generations of cannabis activists. And that's great because we can all learn from each other and in, inspire each other. And you get the young people with the energy and you get the older people with the experience. So if you get them around the table, they can work miracles if you try. This little image to show you how bad things are in Holland. Um, what this is is actually a, a, a scratch and sniff card to help people recognize the smell of cannabis growing. So they did like a pilot project in two cities in Holland where all the, uh, just all the people in town got one of these cards in their mailbox with effectively a call for them to spy on their neighbors and give them up to the police. So this, in their, uh, from their perspective, this was such a great success, this pilot project, that these cards will now be distributed nationwide in Holland. They will, they're they're going to send out like 17 million of these scratch and sniff cards. Talk about uh, reefer madness. And the, one of the VOC projects that's running right now, of course, is that we, together with Mambo uh, Social Club in Belgium, the second cannabis social club in Belgium, we're producing this tour of uh, Doug Fine. And it's great. We're going to, to five countries. We're going to England, to Ireland, and uh, have Doug talk about this uh, green economic revolution, revolution that's, that's happening in America. So this, in any way we try to get out the positive stories and to also get media attention for this other side of the story. Okay, so now we switch from, uh, from the Netherlands to the European perspective. Some of you might have heard of this organization called ENCOT. It's, it started in 1993, so there's 20 years experience uh, in the organization now. Uh, this is like... A, has been one of the main slogans right from the start. The basic human right, like Steve D'Angelo put it earlier today, to just put a seed in the ground and grow this natural plant that can help us in so many ways. So, ANCOT is, um, for me personally, I, I got, first got into contact with ANCOT uh, 10 years ago in uh, 2003, when there was this uh, quite big demonstration in Vienna at the UNODC with the United Nations uh, Office on, on Drugs and Crime. So they had this big summit on, on drug policy back then in 2003. And it was great because really activists from all over Europe gathered to join in this, uh, in this wonderful protest. The weather was great. It was, it, it, you could really see the potential for a European network of, of uh, cannabis activists So now we're all heading down to what they call Uno City in Vienna. That's, uh, it's all UN buildings. And it's great because you pass over the river there on the, on the bridge. And right on the bridge we'll, we released all these hemp, uh, hemp balloons with the, with the hemp seeds in it. And this is how close we uh, could actually get to the, 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 the high powers of international uh, drug policy. Okay, so ANCOT uh, has been trying to, to, to influence drug policy and to get the message out about regulation and legalization and all the negative sides of prohibition uh, to as many countries as possible in Europe. And over the last years, one of the, our major campaigns has been, here's, here's a shot of, uh, of Joop Oma in the middle there, right in the European Parliament in Brussels passionately uh, taking, uh, like, like explaining the case, the, the woman in the red, in the red clothing, she's on the, um, on the European Commission on, on, on Drug Policy. So this is really what we try to do, is have like the voice of the people that are really uh, involved in a grassroots level, get their message out to the, to the people in power, which is a hard job. 
This every year there's the, the General Assembly of ANCOT. This is of, uh, of this year in the Basque Country. So there, we, I think this year we had about 12 or 13 different uh, nationalities attending there. So this of course makes, makes power. If you get the perspective from so many uh, people from, from different countries, you can really do stuff. This is the, the, the steering committee for this, the, the coming two years, I think, with members from uh, Slovenia, Austria, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So, here Cannabis Social Clubs, there has been uh, quite some talk already today about this concept. Uh, Michel Degens from Mambo Social Club has explained how he uh, started his Cannabis Social Club in Belgium. The just, I won't go into it into too much detail, but just give you the, the, the key principle, the, the few key principles for Cannabis Social Clubs. If I can find them back. Let's see. Yeah, one of the, like the first principle is with, with the Cannabis Social Club is that supply follows demand, not the other way around. This is really a key principle. If you compare a Cannabis Social Club to a, like a traditional coffee shop in the Netherlands, of course the, 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 the supply comes first because there's the coffee shop and he is offering the cannabis to the clients. With the Cannabis Social Club you wait and until you have your members, who are members of the club, you ask them how much they want for their consumption, so you know how much to grow, and then you start growing. So this is, especially, this, this is a very big difference between the coffee shop system and the cannabis social club system. The other one, obviously, is that cannabis social clubs are non-profit organizations. It's not commercial. And you could really argue that all the, the repression we have seen in the Netherlands over the last 10 years has to do a lot with that fact that these people make so much money, which is logical in a way because they, they, they really decrease the number of coffee shops. So it's logical then that the coffee shops that, that stay open, they have more business and make more money. So uh, this is important for cannabis social clubs, not a commercial operation, it's a cooperative. The other principle is that you have to be totally transparent. This is very important because you know you're going to be under pressure of the, like the local government or local police. So you always have to be ready to explain, to show your books, to show the, your member list. All this has to be really uh, in order. And also one of the principles is that you are also uh, always ready to engage in a dialogue with the local government or any sort of government or police force that wants to, you communicate with them and explain them what you are doing, which is of course very different from the illegal market. So here to give you an idea of what these uh, cannabis social clubs look like in Spain, this is one in, uh, in the best country, in Durango. So you see it's more, if you would compare it to a normal commercial bar or a commercial coffee shop, it's more like a, a clubhouse. So you pretty much do have everything that you want, like good chairs and TV, and you can smoke there, and there's magazines. But it's, it's really different. It's, uh, the social aspect is very important. Here, coming back to transparency, that it's so important, the books are there. They all have copies of the uh, identification of all the members, and it's all there for any moment that the police can, can step in. They can explain and show them everything. The, the social aspect of the Cannabis Social Club, I think, is, is captured in this picture, which is the, like the member day, the festive day of one of the best country Cannabis Social Clubs, where they throw a big dinner and have music and did a demonstration on how to make butane hash oil and have their own little uh, cannabis cup for the varieties that are there in the region. And it's just great. No, no coffee shop would ever do this kind of thing for their customers. This is the logo of this, uh, this kind of a social club. I won't try and uh, pronounce the name. It's a Basque name, obviously. <laughs> Here's just one picture of uh, quite one of the biggest cannabis social clubs in, in Spain, in Barcelona, IRAM. They have over 10,000 members. And you're not allowed to take pictures, so I only took one. But you can see that this one is more leaning towards yeah, a real coffee shop or more commercialized bar sort of thing. They do sell alcohol as well. The growing part. 
Another crucial difference with the coffee shop system in Holland, of course, is that the, the, the growing is an integral part of the whole cannabis social club concept. There is a direct contact between the growers, the producers of the weed, and the people that are going to smoke it. So th this, this summer I could go to one of the bigger uh, grow facilities uh, in, somewhere in Spain that was working for a, for a cannabis social club. And it was just great. They had over 30 varieties growing there, which in Holland for a commercial, if you're a commercial grower, well, you would never ever have 30 different varieties. Just have the one that finishes quickly and produces the most amount of wheat. So this was lovely. We felt like uh, really like kids in the, uh, <laughs> in the candy store. And good weed too they grow. No fertilizer, just water. And it's uh, a greenhouse of 3,000 square meters. It, which is pretty huge. Let's change this over. This is a lovely uh, sativa, a haze variety from Malaga. Beautiful plant. You see how, how healthy it looks and it's, it's, it's totally, uh, it's grown with, without fertilizers. It's really, really great product. So this you, this you can, this is a, yeah, this I thought was interesting. It's a, it's a Jack Harris strain from Austria that they are growing in the, in the best country. It's quite an international uh, selection. And then simple, uh, simple cannabis smoking logic, I would call it, to, uh, to, make the, to make it dark for the plants, to have the cycle, the 12 hour cycle, just use uh, the black plastic as a curtain and get it over the plants so you can uh, blossom them, er them early. They had like different, different uh, sections for the, the growing cycle and the, the, the plants that were further in the, in the blooming cycle. Really nice. And of course, that, that's very uh, lovely, I think, about the Cannabis Social Club model, is that these people that, that are working there, attending the plants, they are total cannabis lovers. They really, they, they can't wait for the product, like a real home grower is so eager to make the, the, the best weed possible and can't wait to smoke it. All these people that are working there are, are guys like this, so they, they, they totally bowl over the quality uh, that you can get in Dutch coffee shops, even the best known ones. This, this sort of shows the variety. They had all these different strains and then they get the information back of course from the members. The members they pick up some kind of strain that works real well for them and they can, can give the input directly to the growers and say why don't you grow uh, so mango from Durango? Okay, so the, the Cannabis Social Club phenomenon really started in, in, uh, in Spain, in, especially in Catalonia and in the Basque Country. But from uh, around 2008, 2009, uh, in Belgium, uh, they started also trying to get a Cannabis Social Club off the ground. Which was interesting because, of course, their uh, system, their judicial system, is quite different from the one in Spain. But they took the same principle and for Belgium the law was changed I think in 2006, so somewhere around that time, so that every adult in Belgium is legally, has a legal right to own one plant and three grams of cannabis. And this they, uh, they leached onto like a, like a pit bull terrier. They thought, okay, if, if, because it states in the, in, the, in, the, in the law there that if you have only the one plant and you're an adult, the police cannot take this plant away from you. This was like a breakthrough. It's, it's a small breakthrough, but it's small enough, it's, it's big enough to start a cannabis social club. Because if you can have one plant, you can make an appointment with a lot of friends in your club to put all these plants in one grow location. So th these pictures are from the first ever time that they uh, distributed the harvest. Very modest. But it proves an important point because like you can start a cannabis social club, let's go back a bit, you can start a cannabis social club with say seven or eight members and one plant. It's, it's the idea that counts and what you want to do is really find out what happens if you just start and do it. Because you, 
you probably will go to court because Trek Plant also has been to court uh, on two occasions. But then if your story, if you have all these principles that I talked about, the transparency, and the, the non-profit, and, and all these, these key principles, you follow them, it's getting harder and harder for judges to really come down hard on you, especially if your operation is so small. They won't put you in jail for growing one plant in trying to get a cannabis social club off the ground. So with ENCOD, we, we really try to, uh, to give out this message to, to people in all the, the countries in Europe. You can try this and you can use the example of Spain and now use the example of uh, Belgium. Because right now, at this moment, there are four cannabis social clubs in Belgium, so they're gathering some steam. Of course, they grow indoor more than outdoor. The climate is not that great as in Spain. But it's uh, also, it's great weed, because it's made by people who really care for the plants and uh, who are not really in there for the money. The last photos of my series, and then I'm, I'll be happy to, to answer any kind of questions, either on ENCOT or Europe or the Dutch situation. These photos I just got on, uh, on this weekend from a Dutch guy. Uh, they, they are made in California. Look at these plants. It, it, this is like, it's like one plant. It's not like, a, it's just the one. So this gives you, I think, some kind of idea for the future, even if, you, if we would have European regulation stating that you can have five plants, maybe even four plants, the guys who, who grew this, they, they, uh, they say we get six kilos just of one plant. So you, this paints some sort of picture with, uh, with even small scale regulation could work uh, really well for the future, I think. Yeah, so I'll leave this on and we'll ask you if you have any time today to uh, drop by at the Encod stand. It's not far, it's number 161. You can get all the information on, on cannabis social clubs, on the, the, the campaigns we're running in, in Brussels, in Vienna with the UN. We're, we're doing a big action next year in March. You can become a member also as an individual of Encod, but also as an organization or the, the commercial companies can also be a member. And, uh, of course, visit the website. It has a lot of different languages, so that's good. You can probably read the information in your own language. We, of course, always try to do this as a European organization. So that's it. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to take them. Yes, um, thanks for the talk. In the current situation, how do you see the chance for European, for true European regulation? I mean, we're talking about Spain, Belgium, and so on, and very different situations. What uh, would you say, is it possible? Will it get, uh, get somewhere? And what is the current situation in this issue, in a real European for whole Europe uh, regulation? I think the, the only way we could have that is have like a, a, a pan-European concept and we all go there the, at the same time is really if America goes real fast. If, if America would like legalize on a nationwide basis, which is not, it, it could happen maybe, then I think it's the only time that we can have that. But what I really expect is, is that we see what we have been seeing over the years. Some countries go ahead, some countries go back. This, they have their own system like this, like this. So that's also that's what's good about the Cannabis Social Club concept is that you can really adapt it to, to the national situation there with the way you, you fill in the details. So to answer your question, I think the chance that you get a real European solution all in one go is really, really tiny. Uh, cheers for that. Um, how do you uh, find the support from like like the, the cannabis consumers in Holland? Like when you're trying to get out and do these events, like uh, like flash protests and or, and what, what's the what's the response like? And and how do you go about trying to uh, uh, or advice to try and get people to in our own countries to come and like do that, uh, get that a better response? In in the beginning, it was just horrible. <clears throat> Most Dutch people, if you if you say if you talk about cannabis activism in Holland. They were all going, 
it's legal, isn't it, in Holland? Cannabis is legal, you can buy it. So even my own uh, fellow countrymen, and smokers too, were under the impression, like when we started five years ago, that it was pretty much all okay and there, there was no trouble. So really we had to, uh, I think the first few events with Cannabis Liberation, they were, we weren't talking thousands, but hundreds of people, which is crazy because there are so many people using cannabis, of course, I think it's around a million, 800,000 to a million. So you should have more people uh, uh, show up. So, so to answer that, it's real hard. And I think it comes down to, to two things. And the same goes here for, for attracting audiences and getting people active. It's the same with lobbying. You gotta have quality and consistency. You, you gotta keep doing it and you gotta do it right and keep doing it right. And then eventually you'll pick up. But it's so hard to, uh, to predict what kind of campaign gets you into the media or gets a lot of you know, attention from other activists or be a success. The, the French have a nice uh, uh, saying, a slogan for this. They, they say, frappe toujours. And it means like, always keep hitting. You always keep hitting. And then you, you stage a protest and like four people show up. Doesn't matter. Because you don't know when people are inspired or how the, the, you, the ball that you get rolling, what, what, what direction it will roll. So, uh, gotta be optimistic. But it's hard. It's hard to get them out.